I believe resources always follow visions. And people will, I believe God will send the right people to us. The giving is a joy, okay? Giving is a privilege therefore in this regard. So if you can share our facilities, our needs, our finances, whatever, okay? It is such a blessing and a joy for all of us. We teach the children, you know, delay gratification. Uh, what is delayed gratification? You know, that there are things that you don't always get. Marriage is a love relationship. Marriage at the end of the day is about commitment. Irrespective of our own personal feelings or moods as our personal feelings and moods can shift from time to time, from period to period, from stages to stages. Despite everything else, commitment, that love relationship must be there from day one. So for us to have an association, a close relationship with Father, that's our identity. We, we don't look for other sources. That's why a good emotional state for all of us, even your children, is that they will not get offended so easily. <laughs> Some of you are business owner here. I would give a proposal and suggestion. If you have so many employees work under you, uh, don't make them a slave. Don't make them fatherless. Try to give them your love that they also need some time for their family. Well, very good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our Family First Malaysia Zoomina. Uh, tonight, my wife and I will be your moderators, and my name is Richard Tan. Hi, I'm Flores Ng, and we thank you for taking your time to join us this evening. We all know that global inf infl inflation and recession is heading our way, or we are already in it, and we hope that tonight, you will be able to pick up some pointers from our speaker for this evening as how to prepare and face it. Our chairman will introduce the speaker for this evening later on. Uh, as moderators for this evening, uh, let us take care of some house rules so that we can all enjoy a fantastic evening together. Number one, do make sure that your microphone is switched off. The administrator will switch off your microphone when you come in but just in case this is overlooked, do assist us by switching off your own microphone. However, we will encourage you to keep your camera on. And number two, uh, do ensure you are properly attired as this Zoomana is recorded and will be posted on Facebook and YouTube. And I, want, I know you want to look good. Number three, if you have any question to ask, we would ask that you type it in the chat box, which can be found at the bottom of your screen, so that we can pick it up and post it to our speaker immediately when he finishes. In case some of you would like to ask him personally, do wait till the end of the session, and our chairman will open up the platform for discussion and fellowship where time permits. Uh, number four, if you need to eat or munch something, uh, do switch off your camera and enjoy your food while listening with your ears. Number five, do stay to the end of the Zoomina as there will be a photo shoot of all the participants. The chairman of FFM will request you to switch on your camera when the time comes and we will then proceed to take your photo. Uh, number six is uh, just in case if your internet is interrupted or lagging, do not worry about missing out as this Zoomina will be posted on Facebook and YouTube as mentioned earlier, and you can catch up and watch it from there. Number seven, we noticed in the past that there were numerous requests for the link to our FB page. For those who are thinking of asking for this link, just go to your FB page, 
look on the top left side of the page and you will see a search Facebook and you can type in family first, the number one and alphabet ST Malaysia and it will direct you to our FFM Facebook page. Well, for those who are interested in following up with or be kept updated with the activities and seminars of Family First Malaysia, uh, do leave your phone number in the chat box and then the administrator of FFM will pick it up and include you in our mailing list via WhatsApp. Well, I think that's all about housekeeping. Now do sit back and enjoy a short presentation of the vision and mission of Family First Malaysia followed immediately by the introduction of the speaker for this evening by the chairman of Family First Malaysia, Dr. Tan Teck Seng. All right, just for your information, Family First Malaysia is a non-profit organization. We serve people regardless of ethnic, religious background or social status. Vision, we exist to transform next generation fathers supported by mothers to build better families, resulting in a better workplace, a better society, and a stronger nation. And our mission is to be part of a like-minded organization to restore, reshape, and release men and women to become better couples and parents in the context of original marriage with 4F focus. And the 4F are family, finance, fitness, and favor. You will see that this a fit, fitness, family, finance, and favors are these four pillars of Family First Malaysia. So under family, we seek to double our love, joy, and peace in our families to restore broken relationships, reshape the home environment, and release next generation leaders using home as the starting point of leadership training. The, we used following tools under family, and that is the uh, noble family vision, blessing of a happy marriage, role of a husband father, role of a wife mother, the foundation of blessed children, the foundation of the family altar. Under finance, uh, we seek to increase our income or net profit ethically and righteously. We value innovation to double our giving. We've all bet that settled and achieving oneness with money as a family, beginning with fathers and mothers to model better financial stewardship. And the tools we use to, to, for finance is the principles of financial stewardship. God's purpose for money, managing money as a couple, financial freedom. Right. And under fitness, uh, we seek to strengthen our mental and physical health through the cultivation of a positive mental attitude holistic exercise and nutrition recruiting resulting in high energy and wisdom to achieve things of big and lasting impact. Under fitness, we use the following tools. Cultivating a positive personal habit, growing old gracefully. Yep. And the last one is FAVORS, which is an acronym for faithful, adaptable, versatile, optimistic, understanding, and relationships. Mm -hmm. You can follow us on the uh, by taking a snapshot of this QR code. On, and you can also find us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. And um, Family First Malaysia is a non-profit organization, as you said earlier. So we will welcome any, any donation from anyone who felt led by the Lord to work together with us. And the, the and name of our bank is here. And you can take a snapshot of this PowerPoint or the QR code. And we welcome any donation and support from all of you. So thank you very much, brothers and sisters. Hope you have a great time. And I'll pass this time back to our chairman, Dr. Tan Tik Singh. Yeah, thank you once again, uh, Florence and also Richard. Uh, you know, you, this wonderful couple has been a great moderators in our family first. And uh, also welcome all of you, in fact, tonight uh, to this uh, wonderful uh, this, uh, uh, meetings that uh, you are going to certainly bring something home. Now, we know very well that in the Bible, it says very clearly the blessing of the Lord, you know, makes a person rich. 
and he has no sorrow with it. Now, when you are blessed by God because you are, you know, living according to his ways. Now, wealth will be part of the blessing that is established in your life. Now, not only that, there's no sorrow that comes, you know, with that wealth. And tonight, you know, our speaker is going to share with you how you can actually invest and also at the same time to also, you know, accumulate wealth, you know, as a believer. Now, God wants to bless his children in their finances so that they have the resources to carry out his plan for their lives. And our speaker tonight, it is one of the, you know, one of our this, uh, family first directors. He is a chartered accountant by profession. He used to work for this uh, KPMG, formerly known as PMM, as they are this uh, senior partner, right? And also, he was the founder and charter president of Rotary Club of this uh, Kinabalu Sutra and Habitat for Humanity, Kota Kinabalu. He's a you know, uh, board of trustee of this three Mengasi KK. Now, Alan coaches in financial IQ and also financial literacy. And he's a strong advocate in creating passive income and learning to invest early in life. Alan is happily married to Jeanette and they have three adult children and six grandchildren. So without further ado, I pass now the time over to Alan. Alan, over to you. Thank you so much, Alan, welcome. Thank you very much, Chairman, Dr. Tan Tek Singh. Thank you very much to Family First Malaysia. And also I would like to thank your lovely wife, Sister Tinky, kind self for inviting me to share tonight. Greetings from Kota Kinabalu. Richard and Florence, thank you for being the moderators tonight. I hope you can hear me clearly. And tonight we're going to share a few things on finances, which is part of the program of Family First Malaysia under the finance section. All right. So um, thank you very much. Good evening and welcome everybody to our Zoom in now. Today, I want to ask you, what is your money language? And will it determine your health, your wealth, your love, and your happiness? Studies have shown that our money language will definitely, either positively or negatively, will impact our health, our wealth, our love, and our happiness. If we have healthy income and we have healthy money language, we speak positively and we are empowering. We are energized and we are warm and fuzzy with our relationship with money, our health will be better. And as a result, of course, our wealth will also flourish. Under such circumstances, we will be better placed to make good financial decisions and will be a much better and loving person. There will be joy and happiness in our life. And we will be able not only to enjoy the blessings that we are showered with, we will be able to also give and share with others. 
Now we know that words are powerful. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Therefore, we need to guard our hearts. Our words are so powerful that they can sway us in terms of our mood, in terms of the environment which we are in, and also it will affect the behavior of people around us in a working environment, in the office, uh, et cetera. So we got to be extremely mindful of our words. And particularly tonight, we're going to share on the framework. I have a framework, five particular steps, five framework, which I will share with you. But first of all, I recognize that all of us are different. The way we look at money, the way we have been brought up, the way our parents teach us, and also the authoritative figures who are around us before and even now, they are somewhat influencing the way we think about money. It is a matter of not only hard skills when we deal with money, more it is emotional soft skills. And these are the things, the soft skills, what is inside us that controls our thoughts as well as our selves talk. We talk to ourselves multiple times a day. Somehow we talk about money every day as though it is something that we cannot live without. Imagine money occupies so much of our mind, so much of what we are doing every day. I think I probably think about money more than the ordinary folks because of the nature of my work as a management consultant and a business advisor. I look into numbers and certainly I look into talk about money and my money language can be very different. However, I bring forth to you this chart, which is called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. I'm not sure how familiar you are with this, but every human being has needs. These are our needs. The needs of, of um, our physiological needs, our most basic needs, every one of us, regardless of whether we are rich or poor, tall or short, male or female, fat or thin, whatever our background, we will require the most basic needs, that is physiological needs. We need to breathe, we need food and water, we need to sleep, we need to rest. We also need to have safety, security of our body, of our loved ones, of our assets, our resources, our loved ones, our family members. And, and we, love, we need to have love and bonding our family and friends, self-esteem, and ultimately self-actualization. So I bring forth to you Maslow's hierarchy of needs. No matter how we think about money and what our money language is, it will all zero into this triangle. One way or another, whatever emphasis, whatever percentage, it will zero in into Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, I want to share with you my five areas of where my money language is focused. My money language is focused on these five 
structural frameworks, I call them. So that my financial blueprint to build wealth for God's glory will impact with a strong lasting legacy that will sustain with a 100 years vision. Now, I want to explain this a little bit clearer so that you will be able to flow with me. We have focused on these five structural frameworks so that my financial blueprint. Therefore, I want to emphasize to you that I have a financial blueprint. What is this financial blueprint? It is to build wealth. Now, the word is build. The financial blueprint to build wealth for God's glory. I want to emphasize this, to build wealth. We are builders. And what is this wealth for God's glory for? Or impacting. The word key word here is impact with a strong lasting legacy that will sustain with a 100 years vision. Now, 100 years may seem a long time. For me, when I'm looking at it, it is just looking into my grandchildren, my great grandchildren from now, my great grandchildren, which isn't very far away. It's probably 15 years from now. If I'm still around, I will see my great grandchildren. And I'm talking about this strong lasting legacy starting now because I will share with you step by step on my money language and my money direction of how I am doing it. So I will go on to the first structural framework, my first structural framework. My money language framework is based on these five sections. Number one is gratitude. Number two is a written plan. Number three is cash flow. Number four is sharing and teaching. Number five is personal development and money management. Now, this has got to go together. All five of these steps have got to go together, starting with gratitude, a written plan, cash flow income, sharing and teaching, and the personal development and money management. All right? Number one in the framework. These are some of the notes I wrote down. And I start with, I start with, um, the blessings that God has given to me. Therefore, I tell my family, I tell myself that I'm grateful for the shower of abundance that I have been given, the friends that I have, the skills, the network, and the ability. And I express this appreciation I have food on the table, I have clothes on my back, and I have roof over my head for me and my loved ones. I have good friends, I have a lovely family, I go to a wonderful church. All these blessings I express aloud. This is my first framework wherein when I receive all these, I am able and I want to and I positively gyrate forward to show love and to give love and to be generous, kind and loving, to be a good person. Therefore, I'm talking about a scenario where I can express 
good emotions over money. I can be joyful. I can be happy. There are people who are, who are hurt, who are frustrated. They are cheated. They are conned. They were even let down and left out of deals which they were promised. We know for a fact that in our lifetime, people will, will cheat us. People will manipulate us. But let me tell you, you don't have to cheat people. You don't have to manipulate people. I express that we need to be honest, have integrity, and to maintain a good reputation to our name and how we conduct ourselves. For me, I make friends with money. I treat money in a positive way. I feel good, warm, and fuzzy. And I'm empowered and energized. And because I carry myself that way, I think I have a tendency to attract, to attract finances, money, and opportunity. There are people who have fear and anxiety. They worry of not enough. They worry not only of not enough, they have shame and guilt because they have debt and they're struggling with their debt. They do not have enough money to pay their debts. Either they have lost their jobs or they have lost their business. Some people are very angry and frustrated. They are not rewarded for the hard work that they have put in. They're not given opportunities. So they get very, very frustrated. How do we show love to them? There are people who are in despair, people who are hopeless, hopelessness experiencing a situation where they are overwhelmed, they are trapped, they do not know what to do. This will affect their health, their mental health, their physical health, their overall well-being. And being such, they will face challenges which they cannot resolve. Tell me, do you know or do you have, are you aware of such people? What is your money language when they come to you and ask you to help them with finances, to give them money? What is your money language? How do we help friends and people that we know. That's for you to think about. Think about it. Now, my second and next framework is a very important framework. And this framework is something that we all must have that is written plan, and goals. It is extremely important to keep our plans and financial goals nicely written out. So my first framework is I'm grateful. My second framework is I ensure that I plan carefully. I have clarity. I'm very specific. My purposes are clear. Now, bear with me. I'd like to take you along this journey of mine to encourage you, if you do not today have a written plan or written financial goals, please put pen to paper, write down where you are now and where you want to go and how you want to go there. And what will bring you there? What is your purpose? For me, I have a line mindset with my family members. 
I set the direction and the method. If, for example, where you are now and you want to become a millionaire, let me show you the three M's to millions. Essentially, you need to master your emotion. You need to have excellence and to develop a mindset of mastery. Whatever I do, I attempt to do with excellence. I attempt to do with excellence that I can achieve mastery. So there we are. The first thing is I ensure that my mindset is aligned to the goals that I want to set. I ensure that I am a person who is willing to learn from others. They can point out to me and I'm coachable. I ensure and I make sure that my mindset will bring forth to me that I am a person who can make decisions. I'm decisive and also I am emotionally stable and I will commit myself. These are the four elements of having the right mindset. Coachable, decisive, emotional stability, and commitment. The next thing is money management. I need to learn how to manage the money, the size of the money, and also most important is the risk management because any form of any form of investments any form of ventures have risk nothing is 100% if anyone tells you that they have an investment opportunity for you and they guarantee you it is 100% safe run away there is no such thing that is 100%. So we learn to manage the risk and ensure that when we should lose, it is minimized. The third thing is the methods. The methods ensure that we use methods which are powerful and proven. Do not have any fanciful methods, frivolous methods that you hear from unproven personalities and ensure that that method suits your individual style. It suits your way of doing things. These are the things that I do teach some of the young adults step by step to have clarity, to have the methods, to reach their milestone. Each time they reach their milestone, they write down and record their achievements. And there are times we encourage them to celebrate, to celebrate the milestones and, and the achievements. One of the things which I do, and I encourage some of my mentees to do as well is to surround yourself with people who have been there, done that. These are tremendous, invaluable resources. I think many of you here know what I mean when I talk about written plan and goals. You also need to have good friends surrounded by good people, very experienced with the right background. They will provide you with the network connection because you are a person of integrity, a person of reputation. Make a habit of meeting up regularly, regularly with bankers, lawyers, accountants, business people, 
investors, real estate people, real estate agents, insurance people, and also school teachers and professors because they are very well read. They are very deep in their wisdom. They can see things that people in the business world are sometimes having a blind spot and ensure that you have a coach and a mentor. I think it is very important for us to sit down and listen to friends who have made mistakes, friends who have done the business that we want to do and listen to them so that we can avoid the pitfalls, we can avoid the mistakes because mistakes made are very expensive, not only in terms of monetary, it is the time taken to unravel, to try to solve the mistakes, especially in agreements, terms and conditions, joint ventures. Let, let me tell you a, a, a situation, in fact, more than one situation that I was in that I did not put things into writing. It was done with, well, so-called friends, people whom we trust, people whom we have known for a long time. But it was not to be. Things are not what they see. But what do we do? Do we feel bitter? We feel hurt, yeah, for a moment. Yes, move on move on, look elsewhere. Before I go to the next point, I want to tell you that it is very important for each and every one of us, husband and wife, spouse, to write your will. Now, I, I have written my will. I don't know about you, because when I wrote my will, my advisor and the person who wrote my will told me to keep it confidential and lock it up. Is that how you wrote your will? Correct or not? I'm not sure because that was exactly how I learned, how I was aware to write my will and to lock it up, keep it confidential. Don't let anyone see it, especially our beneficiaries. But now I understand it is better to let your beneficiaries be aware of what you have written in the will and let them read it before you sign the will because there are things, there could be mistakes, there could be omissions, there could be situations where they don't want that particular thing you bequeath to them. Let me tell you a story of a friend. He, he has passed away, but he left his valuable bungalow to his four adult children, two of whom are overseas. It was so difficult when they wanted to sell the property to get the two siblings from overseas, first of all, to agree on the price, secondly, to sign all the necessary documents very cumbersome. I am going to review my, my will. Anyway, I think it is very necessary for every one of us to review and refresh our will at least once, at least once a year, if not once in six months. I want to tell you and sh share with you a short background and story of my late 
mother-in-law. You just saw a video and the point is, the thing about this video is, the loved ones surround the man showing very, very sad expression that he may go anytime. You can see from the looks on their faces, from probably his wife, his, his daughter or granddaughter and his son, all the relatives, they look so sad. Now, have you seen a situation like this? They look so sad, but what is it they are really after? Ask yourself this when you write your will. I'm not implying that any of your relatives or your beneficiaries are like that. See, these people, the moment they thought this old man has said bye-bye, they start celebrating, even at his deathbed. Even at his deathbed. And I can tell you, in the business world, this kind of situation prevails. I'll tell you a story about my late mother-in-law who passed on in 2010. She did not have any formal education. She could only speak Hokkien and uh, Cantonese. But yet, she went to see a lawyer. She went to see a lawyer. And she spoke to the lawyer. She looked for a lawyer who could speak Hokkien and explain, after writing down the will, explain the English will to her in Hokkien. And my late mother-in-law was a real true woman of substance. She was very close to all her children. They have six girls and two boys. My late mother-in-law was a very kind-hearted woman of vision. Despite not having any work or not having any steady income, yet she could invest and make sure that she invested in proper, proper housing, that the family will have proper roof over their heads. And all their children were brought up without feeling scarcity or lack. They were all brought up. And now, one of the girls, I married her. I think some of you know her. My wife, Jeanette. She takes after her mother very well. All the sisters, the six girls, are um, very successful in their, their own ways. They are extremely good homemakers, very kind-hearted, including the two boys. They are a very, very close need family. Now, why am I telling you this? The thing I'm telling you is at the time when we have the opportunity, at the time when we can interact, at the time when we can share and become friends with our children, do not neglect them. That is what my money language is telling me, and that is my practice. I direct and refresh you back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And because of such needs, sometimes we get carried away trying to achieve too much. This is my next framework, which I regard to be extremely important. So far, we have covered the first one, which is gratitude and appreciation and love. The second one is on written plan and goals, which is very critical and very important and also highly recommended to everyone to have a written will if you already do not have one. Review your existing one. 
this third one, my third framework is on cash flow, income, on savings and investments. I focus even today, some of you know me, I still focus on income. Income means it will help whatever wealth that we have in hand to grow, to grow bigger. Is it a situation that we are no longer interested in income? We have enough. Investment is too risky. We just want to sit back and enjoy our fruits. Besides, at our age, at our age, our runway is not very long. And it's too much hassle to try to generate more income. We're also too learn, too, too old to learn new things. Very stressful. Also, no point. Lah. What for have some more money? Enough is enough. Yes, that is fair. Are we leaving too much money on the table and eaten away by inflation? So much so that we have a negative purchasing power. Now, what am I highlighting here? What I'm highlighting fits into my blueprint. It fits into my blueprint because income helps to grow wealth. Now, when I speak this way, I use my positive money language to motivate and inspire young adults who just come out to the working world, young, fresh graduates. See, we have four stages in our lives. The first stage when we come out to work is our foundation years. Probably 20 to 30 years old is our foundation years. Those are the years we work. And the second stage will be our acquisition years. That is from around 30 to 40, approximately our acquisition years. And then the third phase will be our accumulation years, which is 40 to 50 or 55, our accumulation years. And thereafter, we can progressively reap our rewards. I say the word progressively. We are looking at the situation. I, for one, I'm still looking at income. Why do I need to grow my income? Why do I need to be building? I am doing this focusing. One of my focus is to build passive income. There are three ways we can make and invest our money to work for us. One is in business. Two is in the stock market, three is in real estate. Now, in the case of real estate, I was brought up in a family where we have no business experience and we did not buy any properties. But when I started playing board games as a kid with my older siblings, and also nowadays with my grandchildren. I began to dig deep when I debrief my grandchildren and explain to them what each step of the way in the game of Monopoly when we play, that there are certain assets and there are certain properties that are of higher value than other areas and you can derive better rental income. I began to dig deeper as a result of that, it inspired and instigated me to look around where I am in Kota Kinabalu. I started 
asking friends. Again, people who have experienced, been there, done that, I look for the iron sharpens iron moment, knowing that in the multitude of counselors, there is safety, inviting them out to yam cha and have lunch. And they tell me their input and their most invaluable. I keep that, make that as a practice in my monetary approach. I ask and I keep asking. The Bible says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you in Matthew 7, 7. It is not just stated by me. Looking at generating income, there was the time when, I don't know if you recall, what year it was when the fax machine first came out. Before that, we did not have the fax machine. And I was based in an office in a small town in Sabah that is in Tawau. And I wanted to buy a fax machine. And the salesman, the salesman did not believe that I wanted to buy a fax machine, which cost 5,000 ringgit, 5,000. Why do I need a fax machine when no one else has a fax machine and I can fax to nobody and nobody can fax to me because they do not have a fax machine. So you see the uncanny situation. I was running my own accounting firm. Why do I need to have a fax machine? It was so new, such a new phenomena. The only two organizations in Tawau, the small town of Tawau that, has, that had fax machine was the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank and North Borneo Timber, which was a public listed company. Only these two companies have fax machines. Why do I need a fax machine as a practicing accountant? Anyway, I bought the fax machine for what? I've got no one to fax to. No one can fax to me, as I mentioned. So I put a small advertisement in the local newspapers, fax machine services available. And people came to use my fax machine especially the timber traders from Japan, the timber traders from Korea. They were dealing with their head office on all the timber quotations, etc. And I charged them a certain rate. And within three months, three short months, I recovered the entire cost of my fax machine. And just to illustrate to you that Sometimes when we see the window of opportunity, we can take action because knowledge on its own is not enough. We have to take action. So <clears throat> can we move to the next one, um, Wunping? This is my next framework, which is sharing and teaching the next generation. I want to start them early for my grandchildren. I acclimatize them and we make this as a family tradition so that they get used to it. And when we play board games and I teach my children and grandchildren, there is a fun environment. And because it is enjoyable, we're having fun, we let down our inhibitions. We start building a bonding, building trust, and building friendship. And we start even confiding in each other. This, this confidence is built internally. I can see it in my grandchildren. They feel more secure. There is one sister in my office. 
in my church who asked me, he says, you can teach your grandchildren because you are an accountant. You can show them, you can teach them financial intelligence and financial literacy. I'm only a housewife. I can't teach them. Nothing is further than the truth. You or anyone can take your youngsters on field trips, take them to the bank, take them for a ride, show them the banks, different names, maybe even take them inside, take them to visit offices of various organizations, your friends, law firm, architect, engineers, even doctors, dentists, expose them when young. It has a great impact on their mind. Tell them how a credit card works. In a restaurant, teach them how the system works. You may not know it 100%. You create a fun learning environment for your children. Share stories with them. Ask them to share stories. The little ones can tell the older ones. What are the lessons learned? Now, even in the simple game of snake and ladders, there are embedded there are embedded gems for the little kids to learn. And what are these embedded gems? They start to learn discipline, punctuality, courtesy, courtesy to each other. They learn to give and take. They learn patience to wait for their turn. They learn to be kind and cooperative. And they learn to be responsible to clear up the board game and clean up after they finish. So we only play snake and ladders. Properly, and we also play the Robert Kiyosaki cash flow for kids, which is a very interesting game for the children to learn about business and to learn about the stock market. This is my final framework, personal development and money management. It is a, also a very important and invaluable framework. My mantra is be excellent, get results, go the extra mile. What is the extra mile? What do you mean by get results? And what does be excellent mean? You be the best of yourself. And what kind of results will you produce? You produce the most excellent, most desired outcome on the projects or on the jobs that they are do doing. And the extra mile does not mean one mile. The extra mile may mean several miles. Are you prepared to go the extra mile out of your comfort zone? Many people are not prepared to go the extra mile and out of their comfort zone. I carry this mantra. I'm trained in such a way that I am a very hardworking person person. My wife, Jeanette, is also a very hardworking person. Both of us do not spend money frivolously, excessively, or unnecessarily. Whatever funds we have, we learn how to invest in properties. Like in the case of me learning in Monopoly, I ask myself, what is one of the most valuable lesson learned in Monopoly. It is four green hotels, four green houses, one red hotel. I don't know if you remember that. Four green houses, one red hotel. You can convert four houses, green houses, to one red hotel. Essentially, the message embedded therein is telling us that we can convert 
our residential unit to a business unit. And with that in my head, drum into my head, that was exactly what I did. I converted many of our properties, our residential apartments, our condos, combine them in the value into commercial properties, commercial properties. We had several condos and apartments, and now we have converted them to 12 commercial properties. And I'm very blessed and very happy to say that 100% of our commercial investment shop houses have been tenanted. And 95% of our tenants are class A tenants. They pay their rental on time and they are doing very well in the premises that we have rented to them. The personal development and money management is something that we got to do what we call continuous and never ending improvement. This is the mantra of one of my Sifu, Anthony Robbins. And why we need to improve progressively, bit by bit every day. And it is very important. So in personal develop, uh, development and money management, it is very important for us to improve day by day. I am a daily learner. I subscribe to many courses, to seminars, and I also do a lot of online studies. I do at least three hours of studies wherever I can. And, and um, I play my role well. I make myself accountable. I tell my adult children, I tell my wife what I'm doing. Nothing to hide, nothing to lose, nothing to prove. But I want to walk my talk and talk my walk. I want to be responsible and keep, I keep good records. Many of the records in my organizations are kept by me. I keep notes and I have regular and up-to-date reports. And as I do things, I interact regularly with my tenants. I make sure that they know me and I know them and what are the issues that they are, they are facing. I learn every day because I want to improve and I want to keep abreast with my adult children. And also so many new things are even happening at the level of my grandchildren. In fact, when I look at their arithmetic for their homework, frankly speaking, they are very complex and quite difficult to do. I've been out of touch with that segment of the curriculum. However, slowly but surely, I could get back to it. To recap, in summary, I mentioned gratitude, written plan, cash flow income, sharing and teaching the next generation, personal development and money management. I have the relevant scripture verses to support my money language framework herein. And if you recall, it is my blueprint to glorify God with a vision to impact with a 100 years framework. I'm using this and using this on a day-to-day -day basis for my money language, my thoughts, my investments, etc. So if you were to ask me to be specific, is there a target for my amount. I have not set a target, but one thing I want to say about income. When we were young, we were told to set aside at least 10% of our salary for savings. Now, how about putting aside 
100%. It will amaze you if that request is made to say to put aside 100% of your income. Now, when I focus on income now and build wealth, and I generate a new income, let's say I write an e-book, I write an e-book, and I put it on Amazon and sell it. Now, this e-book can be a million-dollar seller. I don't know because I have not tried it. Let's say I go to Udemy and put on a course to teach people on financial intelligence just for a fee of 49 ringgit. And 10,000 people subscribe to my course. I only need to do the Udemy course once, put it online, and the whole world will be my market. I can write an ebook. I can do affiliate marketing. I can do drop shipping. I'm not talking about the brick and mortar business. So that takes too much capital, too much time. Too much time. Today, it is the e-business. We can do a lot of e-business from the comfort of our home. So when I say 100%, you can put aside 100% for investments. That is what I mean. If you earn extra 1,000 US from internet business, you don't need it for survival. You don't need it for lifestyle. You can use the entire amount for investment. Well, this is my summary of my money language framework. And I tie this up very much to Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs, which everybody needs. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, uh, Brother Alan, uh, for that uh, insightful uh, sharing. Um, I know this is something that everybody thinks about, but it's not everybody can achieve it. As you say, we need a lot of discipline. Um, and we know sometimes it's very difficult. Uh, I think many of us have gone through some difficult times that we don't have, our income is not even enough to feed our daily needs, how to put aside the savings. Uh, we have gone through that. But discipline makes a lot of difference. Uh, there's one thing you mentioned about having, um, uh, we want to, I want to ask you, is that uh, in your opinion, how much is enough? Now we've seen a lot of people, you know, they're so rich and yet they're still slogging out there, taking time to earn more. Um, and always seems to ne never have enough. So what is a comfortable amount that you think is enough? What is your opinion on that? I think, I think everybody say we have enough, but I don't think everybody knows it's enough. Um, Brother Richard, that's a very, very good question uh, indeed. If you do not have any financial commitments on loans for your car or your, or your property, then, you know, just like my wife and I, we actually don't need very much. And some people who are so fearful about uh, medical expenses and so on. Like for me, at my age and at my stage, I don't have to worry too much about education expenses for my children because they're all grown up past the stage. So it depends on the people. If you're talking about um, us, I would say, I don't know. Because today, today, when you are investing your money, and if you're holding it in ringgit, in RM, the question you need to ask yourself is, shall I invest into another currency? And if so, which country do I invest in? And the third thing is, which class of asset? I call this the three Cs, currency, country, and the class of asset. 
Now, this is a very, very intricate situation, especially there's been a lot of talk about the de-dollarization of the US dollar, right? So yes. if you have a million dollars US, they're also talking about in Sweden, in Switzerland and Denmark. In fact, they have already started a few years ago on giving negative interest rate. Now, let's say you have $100 million. A person is so rich, he's having $100 million. But the country in which it comes from has a interest regime of negative interest rate of minus 10%. Minus 10%. It means it's 100 million in the bank. Every year, the bank is taking 10 million away from him. Now, these are real, real issues that are happening now. How strong is our currency? I am not an expert in Forex, but fortunately, in our country, the cost of living generally compared is still quite cheap. My wife is right now visiting her relatives in Singapore. Uh, she's sharing with me the cost of food and transport is extremely challenging compared to Malaysia. So I don't have a figure to give you. It depends mm. whether you live in the kampong or whether you live in the city and in the city, which city. I think Penang can be quite cheap. Yeah. All right. Certain towns in West Malaysia, in, in the east coast of West Malaysia, can be quite cheap. Mm. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, it does give you an idea because um, it all depends upon your environment and where you are located. Uh, so you find that where you are now, if you can afford it and you don't like the cost of living here, move to a smaller place. In fact, uh, my wife and I have also thought about, uh, you know, if after we have settled everything here, we can sell our house and just move to KK, Standard of living is so much lesser and so much peaceful. Or even to be like, well, come you, you know. <laughs> you know, these are things that all of us mind have. you, uh, brother Richard. Right. Yeah, mind you, uh, uh, cost, cost of living in KK um, is by no means cheap, huh? it's oh. even more expensive at times yeah. than KL, you know. Well, this is uh, what we are facing. If we get, um, I'm sure people at our age, we have seen the times we've gone through, you know, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and now in the in the, two, two, the 2000 plus. I think all of us got different experience. And now what, uh, since I have no question from anyone, I think they are still digesting what they have shared and uh, going through their heads, uh, what to ask. I will pass this time back to uh, Brother Tantik Singh. And uh, we will, I think we will open up. And if there's any question you ask, I think we still have time. You can ask our brother, Alan, directly. <laughs> then he can answer you. So I'll pass this time back to brother Tantik Singh. Yeah, thank you, Richard, for uh, this uh, moderating to my session. And uh, yeah, because we have some uh, hiccup on some of the technical issues. Uh, so uh, just apologize to some of you, you know, out there who has also sent me uh, private messages, you know, saying about this, uh, you know, the, the, the video and so on. But nevertheless, as I said, that tonight uh, the content is pretty good. And uh, uh, what actually Brother Alan shared actually from his uh, personal experience. And likewise, I think all of us, as what, uh, you know, this uh, Richard was sharing that, you know, we are in the 60s, 70s, you know. So uh, our... Our this uh, perspective in life is very very different from those who are in their thirties and forties, right? So uh, for those of us, as I say that, uh, you know, if you if you look at the younger people, they look at you, they say, of course, you can say like that because you already make it, you know, uncle, you can you already make it, but we are still struggling, you know, uncle. <laughs> so a lot of young people they are still struggling, all right? So uh, in the sense of the, they have a house to take care of the housing loans, they have a car to take care of the you know, car loans, 
and then they have insurance. They have to also take care of their children's education. Now we have all gone through that, right? So uh, of course, in the past, it was a lot easier in the sense of we still have some spare cash where we could actually be able to invest in properties because in the earlier days, it was easier to actually borrow money from the bank. When you have, a, I mean, you were a banker, Richard, you know, so easy to borrow money from the bank and we were able to actually uh, buy properties. Now, I remember that this, uh, this uh, I know of this guy who is just operating a small little highway shop in Broga, right? Now, during those days, Broga properties was so cheap. The shops only selling about 50, 60,000. You know, that was in the, we are talking about 20, 30 years ago, right? And today, this man who has, you know, over the years, bought two rows of shops on the opposite sides of the roads. And he is the richest man now in Broga, right? Because he owns all the properties and uh, now the shop lot is worth almost, you know, close to uh, $2 million each. So you look at the appreciation, you know, but today, uh, many young people, they don't look at property anymore. They look at even, you know, in the, in the share market, foreign forex exchange. In fact, the young people today, they are more savvier, IT savvier, and they even make more money than many of us who are in this, still in the you know, brick and mortar kind of business, right? So the younger people, they are very fast, you know, in terms of even, you know, turning the money very fast. Uh, so the world is changing, right? So I'm sure that the, tonight we have also learned quite a fair bit from Alan as uh, experience and also sharing. And uh, if you have any other question that if you want to ask the speaker, we still got time. I think we can still ask the speaker, right? And uh, I'm sure there are some of you here who are in your 30s and the 40s, all right? Then you may want to ask Uncle Alan, all right, some of the you know uh, questions, all right? Any one of you, any question that you want to ask Alan? I think we have to unmute them first at all. Uh yeah. Let me see, yeah. Okay, I think we have to unmute all of them, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, this uh, brother thing has... Uh... Yes, I have a question. Uh, this question actually addresses, you know, people who are, who are from very poor families. For, for instance, you know, you have civil service people working for the government. Uh, you know, this, the salary, salary certainly is not commensurate with uh, the inflation, for instance. And I've, I find it very difficult to conceive how they can get up, get out of these kind of situations. Uh, Alan, can you share some of your thoughts on what can be done in these kind of situations? Thank you for your question, uh, Brother Ni. I think in our country, uh, in Malaysia, the opportunity for having a side hustle um, is, is quite prevalent. You know? um, whenever I go into a grab car, I literally not just talk to the driver, I interview him and why he's doing, what he's doing, and so on. The, general answer comes back is they're earning well and they have independence. Now, more specifically in the situation of uh, civil servants who are earning below a certain level, the, the government may call them, I don't know whether they fall under the B40 category. There are there are support from the government, from, from uh, finances that are given to them. Uh, 
especially during the COVID time. But of course, those are very, very small amount. But how do we actually measure living need? How do we actually measure the, the cost of living between, say, KK and, and JB? You are in JB, right, Brother Brother Nick? Right. Are you in JB? Yes, I am. Right. How do we compare the cost of living between Johor Bahru and KK and, and even, let's say, um, KL, right? The cost of living index, when it's given to us, is, is a few years old and we can't even understand it. But what it actually means, you know, it says the cost of living is so many percent, so many. Actually, if you look at the loaf of bread and you look at a place of noodles, it has gone up 20, 30 percent. So, how much? Yep. I mean, generally, we compare by looking at a plate of chicken rice. How much is a plate of chicken rice in JB compared to KL, compared to KK? In KK, a plate of chicken rice is nine ringgit. Nine ringgit. So I don't know whether that is high compared to where you are. So how to help all these people? Well, the government has got their ministry people looking into it, and I think there are a lot of bantuan that will help them. I cannot put you off the cuff of my hand, but I say that. It is going to be increasingly challenging. But the good thing, the good thing, uh, the good thing is uh, people even go to make money. Uh, the creative ones, uh, the creative ones are even generating money on YouTube, TikTok, right? And uh, uh, Udemy, as I mentioned earlier. So these are the areas, but not everybody knows how to do those technology, right? So um, that's, that is why I recommend and I, I propound that uh, our personal development, we must empower ourselves and speak to the younger people in the same language, in, at the same level. So when they speak, we understand. Otherwise, we are lost. Now, one of the things why I continue to want to learn and upgrade myself is, I want to make sure that I don't, I don't get dementia, you know, and I don't become forgetful and be a, a guy sitting at home, nothing to do, just uh, complaining here and there every day, right? So I have something that is productive. I spend my time doing productive work that generates income and hopefully substantial income. And then with that, I teach younger people and people who wants to know how to learn, to, to learn how to do that. I teach them, I show them, I guide them, right? And whoever can learn on that, well, I'm available, you know, teach them, you know, right? But I have to learn it myself first. Mm -hmm. I hope that helps me. Uh, Ellen, there's a question here uh, posted to you. If we ask our children before signing inheritance, isn't it possible for them to question our decisions and uh, might lead to unnecessary arguments? Now, after all, I feel that's how the, you know, uh, I feel inheritance is a privilege, not an entitlement. What is your view? Yes, that is one school of thought which we need to respect and I have been following that inheritance uh, is not a privilege and indeed we keep it confidential and we then open, open the will. Well, some people, some of the next of kin or loved ones may feel very jubilant, may feel very happy and some may feel that they deserve more, you know. And, um, you know, when I put into my will, uh, um, I, I followed the, the way that I believe, uh, you know, uh, inheritance, 
Okay, I don't want them to know. And there's some you even say, oh, if your children know that you have a lot of money and you put it in the will for them, uh, they will wish that you go go fast, you know. You say bye bye fast, you know. So uh, that is one way which, which um, of course, we don't like, you know. But um, I think there are a lot of benefits, huh? because if we're looking at finance and money, communication and engagement between family members, it is very important to have the soft skills to open ourselves. Because we have hardened ourselves so much that it's so hard to bring up a subject. You know, a friend of mine who has his adult children overseas, he, he wants to share his financial situation. I mean, he's doing well, he's okay. You know, but they don't want to listen. They don't want to hear. They are not interested, right? He he cannot even reach out to his grandchildren. To, I mean, the grandchildren are slightly older, but um, they don't want to hear him. So if you have a situation where you cannot communicate and things, and after the person has gone and what you have written in the will, it may even cause more more uh, dissatisfaction and jealousy. Rather, I mean, when you are still around, everybody discuss, you know, you see? So I have one Rolex watch. I have three children, two are boys. Huh? So who do I leave it to? I have a very nice golf set. So which son do I leave it to? The golf set. All right. So one son, I leave the Rolex watch. The other son, I leave the golf set. Huh? All right. I cannot let them share half-half. Anything that is shared, percentage wise they will take and sell it which is fine right up to them you know mm. all right i think our time is uh, do you think uh, yeah the um yeah especially when you mentioned about that the uh, rolex watch and also talking about golf set a uh, rolex watch costs a lot more right so of course some of them they say that instead of uh, just you know uh, keeping the Rolex box for to a son that you favor, you know more than the other one, uh, so that also we create problem, right? So the important part is is that when you have the asset, the most important thing is is that you know to convert them into cash, so that when we have the cash, you can divide equally. If you have the asset, you got a big problem, you know, because why right, you got four children, one you want to give away bungalow, one you want to give away a shop lot, and one you want to give away a condo, another one you want to give away a flat. So how do you actually justify that? So sometimes it will land you up, you know, especially for us when we actually write the wheel and uh, we also land ourselves into a lot of, you know, difficulties when it comes into uh, the wheel writing, right? So most important is, Spend. I tell, told my, you know, I tell my children that look, I will just spend whatever that I, you know, that I have, and uh, when I I'm gone, then of course whatever that I have left behind, then you can share, right? So in the meantime, I'm doing, you no, know, I'm spending my kids' inheritance. You no, know? <laughs> we are spending our kids' inheritance. Yeah. So anyway, time is, is up. And uh, is there any uh, announcement, uh, Tinky? Do we have any announcement before we uh, close this meeting with a prayer and then we will take a picture, right? Tinky, you have any announcement? Uh, no announcement. What I do is, why don't we uh, close with a prayer and those people who want to stay back, you may uh, do so. Um, I think Ellen don't mind, right? maybe about 10 minutes or so, just to check and any other question that you may have, you can also ask. Okay. Yeah, Thank okay. you, everyone. All right. So we'll close it the prayer. with a word of prayer, all right? Uh, Lord, we want to thank you for tonight. Thank you for Ellen's sharing, especially, you know, the, uh, you know, you know, the gems that he has given to us tonight. Father, we just thank you for those of them who come on to listen and even for those who miss out, but that they can go into our Facebook 
to also pick up, you know, whatever that's been shared tonight. Father, we thank you for every one of them before we depart from here. That I pray, the Lord, that you continue to protect each and every one of them from all harms, especially now the weather is very hot, so that they will drink lots of water, get themselves hydrated, and keep themselves safe. And also keep them away from all these uh, viruses, even, even uh, those, uh, you know, the cough and flu uh, symptoms, they are now uh, escalating in, in, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the community. Father, we just pray the Lord that you bless each and every one of them. You keep them in good health. You bless them in Jesus' name. Amen.